Hi everyone, this is Tochi with today's class on how to make offerings to spirit guides. This is important to people who are into indigenous spiritual practices or indigenous religions. So not so much for those who are involved in Abrahamic faiths or other kinds of faiths where sacrifices are not needed or offered, something like that. But these are for people who are into indigenous modes of spiritual practice and, and religions, okay? So a lot of people have been writing me and asking, how do I do this? How do I do this? And I think I got a little bit tired of typing it out all the time or trying to text it, you know, or trying to respond on WhatsApp or whatever. Well, this is what you do. Step one, do this. Step two, do that. So, yeah, okay. So no, we're going to get with the program. We're putting together um, this class today so that you, in the comfort of your own home, can learn how to do this. Understand that this is an overview class. You need to understand that you may have to do a little bit more research and ask a little bit more questions to get to more specifics. But what we're going to discuss in today's class is going to be enough of a foundation to get you started. So don't go anywhere and let's get this started. Welcome to my family. Let's get started. But as usual, before we start the class class, we have some housekeeping to do. If you need to get a hold of me, click on the link in the description below the video. You can book me for your personal readings, cowrie shells or cards. And you can also get my products and services when you click on that link. You can also follow me on Instagram and Facebook when you click on that link. If you are not yet a subscriber, you can click on the subscribe button, which I highly recommend because when you do that and also click on the all notifications button, then you will know when I put out good material like this again. And you will also get to know when I'm on live because we have so much fun when I'm on live. You need to go check out my old live videos. We have so much fun when we're together, especially during our prayer sessions. If you'd like to be a support to my channel, you can click on the join button and you can become a member of this channel. I have two levels there, the Pathfinder and the Apprentice. Find the one that suits you. If you need more information on that, please read the description below this video. I also have the Master Teacher Level Membership, which is on Facebook. It's a private Facebook group and is subscription only and by invitation only. The details are also in the description below here. Master Teachers get additional videos, additional classes, and additional support about the practical spiritual topics that we talk about here. And again, take a moment to give me a thumbs up if you do enjoy this content because it encourages me to produce more content like this. So I think we took care of all of that. And for those of you who are already members and subscribers, thank you. I couldn't do this without you. So let's get into it. Why would you want to give offerings to spirit guides in the first place? There are a lot of indigenous religions and, and spiritual paths that state that you need to give these offerings. They look at spirit guides or spirit entities the same way that we as human beings look at ourselves. You know, you want someone to give you something to eat, something to drink to make you feel comfortable. Okay. Sometimes you want to eat and drink together, hence the sense of communion, eating together, having dinner together, having a meal together. And actually, when you look at Christianity and the concept of communion, having communion, the prayers, inviting the invitation, come and partake in the communion, you get to understand that 
even in Christianity where the communion is offered, guess what? That is also an offering. It's an offering. You are being invited by the leader as a spirit, because remember that you are our spirit too. You are being invited to come and partake in this communion. And communion, again, is all about eating together. Even when you're in the Catholic Church, you know, and, and the priests raise the, the, uh, the host, or what they call the host, which is the wafer and says hey everybody here's you know what we're going to share and here is what it represents and i'm inviting you to come and partake of this because the person or the consciousness that this is represented by is also here as part of this communion or this feast or this eating together because the concept again is that the christ is also there as and the saints and others are there present as the communion is being presented, prayed over, blessed, and shared. So you find out that when you look at a church like Catholic Church or Anglican Church or any place where they give communion, it is making offerings to spirit guides. I know people might call it something else or quibble with it or argue with it, but in plain English, that's what it is. You're inviting the unseen to come and eat with you. You're eating with the unseen. That's what communion is. So indigenous religions, of course, a lot of them predate Christianity. They predate um, the Abrahamic religions and a whole bunch of other religions. There are other religions like Hinduism where also offerings are being made. Um, I can't think of other religions right now, but again, around the world, you do have uh, old religions, old majority religions that offer sacrifices. You do have the more modern ones that also uh, make these sacrifices or they make these offerings uh, like Candomblé, Lukumi, Santeria, Voodoo, um, I think the practices in uh, Ifa, you know, in this part of the world, people mistakenly call it the Yoruban religion, but in reality, there's nothing called the Yoruban religion. Yoruba is actually a tribe in West Africa that spans from Nigeria all the way to Ghana, okay? They are a tribe of people called Yoruba. So, but of course, in this part of the world, you hear people saying, well, I'm a practitioner of the Yoruban religion. No, it's just like saying I'm a practitioner of the Englishan religion or the Frenchan religion. No such animal. <laughs> okay. Anywho, I digress. You also find a lot of these practices in Africa, South America, in Asia, again, where you have a lot of these really, really old indigenous religions, okay? And some of the more modern ones pull from that. You will also find the concept of offerings and sacrifices in paganism, in Wicca, neo-paganism, people who are into Celtic uh, uh, religions, uh, druids, wizards, and stuff like that. There are people who are also into the ancient Norse uh, religions. They also get involved with offerings to spirit guides. So we're not talking here about something that's newfangled or invented by me. Though I would like to invent something. I need to work on that. Maybe I need to uh, put that down as something to do. Invent a new religion. Anyway, coming back to reality, okay? So this is not new. Now, the first thing we need to uh, understand is why it's done. Again, uh, like I said during the intro, people do this because it's a way of welcoming, communing with, and appreciating spirit guides. If they've been doing things for you, it only makes sense that you want to offer a token of appreciation. There is no way you could possibly 
feed any spirit guide or spirit entity to the point where it's satiated and it doesn't want to eat anymore. I mean, think about yourself. You can go to an all-you-can-eat buffet and eat all you want and think you're full. Next day, you're going to be hungry, okay? So it's the same thing with the spirits. So you offer some today, you offer some some other time, okay? We want to make these offerings, okay, in order to make these guides more favorable to our prayers and petitions. Think about it. If someone was always coming to you and saying, help me, 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 but they never gave you anything. After a while, wouldn't you get tired? I think you would. So everybody loves a little bit of appreciation. No different with our spirit guides. There comes a point where the help me, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me has to be like, hey, I need to give you something so that you are motivated to continue helping me. It also opens channels. Offerings also open channels. Because remember again, in the universe, it's all about give and take. Creation, motion of energy coming and going, coming and going. Offerings are a form of energy. So when you give offerings to spirit guides and spirit entities and beings that you work with in your indigenous uh, practice or indigenous religion, okay, you are facilitating transfer of energy back to yourself. You give, you get. You give, you get. You give, you get. Give and get. Give and get. Get the picture? I'm sure you did. So, you want to be giving because you will be getting. And because you want to get, you have to give. Now, the other thing to understand is this. When you give these offerings, especially of foods, of edible things, whether they're cooked or raw, you also should understand that these things have a shelf life. Okay, unless it's something in a bottle that's sealed, even even then those things have expiration dates, don't they? Yes, they do. So you want to make sure that when you make these offerings, you put them in a way such that after a while you can clear them away. Well, Dr. Tochi, why, what's the point of making these physical offerings to spiritual entities or beings or guides when I can't see them come down and eat it? That's not the point. They partake of the energy, the essence of what is being offered. As those things are on your altar or wherever you put them, whether it's outside or inside, and they start breaking down, they release energy. And the spirits, the guides, they now work with that energy. That is the secret behind these offerings. A lot of people won't tell you that because they don't know that. Okay, so should you leave the offering there at your altar in your home until it rots and becomes one huge mess of, of crawling maggots? Of course not. You leave it there for two, three days, maybe a week, depending on the humidity level of where you live, and then you dispose of it in nature. Again, there are indigenous authorities who will tell you that the more that offering decays, the more powerful the release is and the more accessible that energy that is in the offering becomes to the entities to which it was offered. Was that a mouthful? You can rewind and listen to that again. So moving forward, what do we offer? Generally, you are safe with fruits and cooked foods, okay? You are safe with that. No controversy about that. You don't want to come to your altar and make it a literal grocery store of stuff, okay? You can get whatever it is that you eat, you yourself as a human being eat, you can 
safely offer that to the spirits. The only time that rule does not apply is when you are familiar with that spiritual practice and an experienced leader or practitioner says to you, this spirit guide prefers this, then give that guide, uh, that spirit guide what it prefers. Don't give it what you want, because remember, you're the petitioner. You're the one who wants their cooperation and their help. So don't be like, well, um, well, um, I do know that I'm supposed to give spirit guide X some eggs, but I'm vegan and I don't eat eggs. Therefore, I'm going to give the spirit guide some tofu. Really? Really? Give that spirit guy some tofu and see what happens. Uh-huh. Give the spirit what they want. If they want alcoholic beverages, give it. If they want non-alcoholic beverages, give it. If they want fruits, give it. Vegetables, give it. Cooked food, give it. Meat, give it. Red meat, give it. Poultry, fish, whatever they want, give it to them. If you have not been given any restrictions in that religion or spirit, spiritual practice as to what you can give, give them what you yourself would normally eat. Some of the uh, amusing things I have heard and seen online um, are people who work with spirit guides, who work with blood sacrifice and raw meat and they turn around and say well i'm a vegan so i am giving um the spirit nothing blood i'm just going to give the spirit what i think it needs to have which is fruits and vegetables now i was about to say would you do that with your pet but i i, I just remembered now that actually there are some people who force vegan diets upon their pets and that's okay if the pet is not complaining and doesn't come back and bite them in the butt in the middle of the night, I guess you and your pet, you're okay. But you need to understand that spirit guides are not pets. There's a reason why they need specific offerings if you have been told what those specific offerings are because spirit guides have specific functions. You can't ask the spirit guide of wealth to give you children. That's not its job. You can't ask the spirit guide of fertility to promote you at work. That's not its job. So as each spirit guide has its own function, they have the specific things that work for them and work with them. So it is in your own interest to do that research and find out for the spirit guides you are working with, the entities you are working with, what do they prefer? If you're working with a guide that prefers animal sacrifices, blood sacrifices, again, that's what you have to deal with and that's what you have to work with. You chose that path. <laughs> All right, you know, we love to have fun here in class. All right. So you need to work with whatever path or indigenous religion that you are on. You need to work with the guidelines there. When it comes to ancestors who are also, they are forms of spiritual guides. In general, you can pretty much offer your ancestors whatever it is that you eat. If these are ancestors that you used to know, people who used to be on this side, you can offer them things that they loved or liked to have when they were on this side. Sometimes people would offer cigarettes or tobacco or rum, whiskey, gin, you know, whatever the case may be, because they, they know that when this person was on this side, that was the kind of stuff that they like. And you, and you place the offering on your ancestral altar and you invite them over and say, Hey, I brought you your favorite, uh, Cuban cigar. And here it is with a shot of, uh, whiskey or rum or whatever it is. And, and believe it or not, 
they will respond. Either you will get something in your dream, they'll come and visit you, or they will show you one way or the other that they have accepted these offerings. Offerings are essential for progress along these kind of spiritual paths. When you stop making these offerings or you don't offer them on time, you will find out that the petitions and prayers and the rituals and the practices that you're doing there will tend to stop as well because you have not supplied the energy that they need to do that work for you. Think of it this way. Let's say that every time you went to work, you always got a hot breakfast and at lunchtime they gave you a hot meal. Suppose they stop that and you know, you were still expected to work. Are you going to be happy working? No, you're not going to be happy working because you're going to be hungry. Yes. So give the spirits what they want. Now, Dr. Tochi, where do we place these offerings? You can place these offerings on your altar. You can place them, uh, if your altar is inside the home or outside the home, you can place these offerings there. If they're outside, obviously, you don't need to spend time curating the offering. You can leave it there, it can decay, uh, break down, go into the earth, you know, the rabbits or cats or whatever will take care of it. You don't need to worry about that. You have played your part. You can't be there policing the wild animals that go out there. You know, you, you, really, you really can't. All right. Now, another thing is there are certain uh, practices or rituals that will say to you, go place the offering on the roadside. Go place it at a crossroad. Go place it in an open marketplace. Go place it in a body of water. Go place it inside the water or by the water. Go place it in the forest. Okay, dig a hole and put it there. Go place it in the middle of the field. It's because the specific spirit guides whom you're making that offering to, that's where they go. That's where they go. So you want to take it to them there. If that's what is dictated in your spiritual or religious practice, then that's what you have to do. If they say, okay, put this thing together, go place it under a tree, this specific kind of tree, or go put it at the shrine, or go put it at this, uh, you know, wherever it is, understand that that's the requirement for that indigenous practice. That's where you need to put it because according to their experience and their knowledge, that is where the spirit guide or the spirit entity that they're working with, that's where it goes. So you want to take your offering there where it goes. And then when you go there, get there and place it there, you make your petition and go about your way. Don't put your, for instance, if you've been told go and place it at the roadside or at an intersection like a four, you know, four way or T junction, three way, don't go there and place it and say, okay, where are you at? Where you at? Food's here. Food's ready. No, you place it and you leave it. <laughs> what happens to it after that is none of your concern. It's none of your business, okay? Have fun with it. Go there. You know, thanks. say thanks for, you know, listening to me, hearing me, and helping me out. Here's your offering. And please accept it as presented, you know. A lot of times we don't make offerings perfectly. Sometimes we forget something or miss something or do it in the wrong way. And let them know and say, hey, I'm doing this, you know, to the best of my ability. So please don't count it against me that this is not perfectly done. And put it there, the heart, the intention, it matters. Okay. A lot of spirits congregate according to these authorities, a lot of spirits tend to congregate at crossroads, at intersections, in public places. A lot of unfed spirits also congregate in these places as well. So let's say, for instance, someone has not been taking care of their guardian spirit, their ancestors, or other spirit guides who've been assigned to help them they would congregate at intersections and public places just looking to see, is there anybody else who is presenting an offering? And then they will partake in that offering. Well, what's the downside of that? If you're not taking care of your spirit guides, you're not taking care of your guardian spirit, you're not taking care of your ancestors, and someone else is doing that, 
I have a feeling that some of the spiritual support you're getting might be reduced because of that. And there are a lot of experienced, experienced spiritual practitioners who will tell you that. If someone else is feeding your ancestors, someone else is feeding your spirit guides, and you're going about your business and living your life about that business, the person has the ability to tell your spirit guides to stand aside and let them do whatever it is they want to do with you or treat you any which kind of way. Why? Because you did not take care of your spiritual protection crew, okay? Imagine that you had bodyguards and you weren't feeding them. Do you, how long do you think they're going to hang around you continue to continue protecting you? Well, your guardian spirit technically will stay with you regardless, but it might not look at you favorably like, hey, I see you're eating every day, living high on the hog, and you're not offering me nothing, not even water. Okay, I'm going to teach you a lesson. I'm going to let Johnny over here bash you over the head. Maybe you might gain some sense. Okay, so again, you want to uh, do what you have to do to make sure that your spirit guides are fed they are happy, their bellies are full, so they can answer uh, your petitions, your prayers, and they can work with you. Again, when you get involved in indigenous religions, when you get involved in indigenous spiritual practices, there's so much about spirituality you get to learn, and it's so fascinating, and you're like, what, what? Now, if your if your spirit guides again require some kind of animal killing, you know, blood sacrifices and stuff, my suggestion to you is find a qualified person to do that for you. Don't be running around with a kitchen knife and a chicken through your house. Your neighbors are going to call the popo on you. Well, of course, depending on where you live, but in my neck of the woods, you're running down the street with a chicken and a knife. They're going to be calling the popo. There is a crazy lady running down the street with a chicken and a knife, and it doesn't look like she's trying to kill it for her uh, soup pot. No, you don't want to be that neighbor. Okay, get a qualified person to do that for you. There are some communities, even here in the United States, they get together and do these ritual uh, uh, animal sacrifices, you know, because, of course, in this part of the world, you can't literally get a pig into your home and start slaughtering the pig in your home. Um, I, I'm thinking that that's going to be awfully messy. Really, really messy. So there are some communities who, again, like in this part of the world, everybody has the right to, you know, their kind of, you know, spiritual practice. So they come together, um, they get the animal that they're going to use, you know, for their sacrifice and offering, and they do it ritualistically. So they have the rituals, the prayers, everything is done properly. Um, and they have a leader who guides them through that whole thing. And then um, they cook it and eat it. And, and that, again, becomes the communion. Can you eat what you place upon the altar? Uh, there are some authorities that say, yes, it's expected that if you put something on there that you take a little bit and say, hey, I'm having this as a sign of communion with you to let you know that, hey, um, you know, Here's what I'm offering you, and um, I, I want you to enjoy this. There's some other authorities that say, once you place the offering, just leave the offering and just walk away. Again, you need to do the research and find out what your particular spiritual practice demands. In general, I would say, once you place that offering on your altar or place it wherever it is that whether it's inside, outside, wherever it is you place it, just leave it alone. Just place it. Hey, y'all brought this for you, enjoy, and then go about your business. Lastly, another form of offering is when you're eating, when you have your plate of food, be thankful. Take a moment to be thankful. You can say, my creator, I invite you to my food, a partake of my food. I invite you, my guardian spirit, my guardian angel, my ancestors, my spirit guides, prophets, messengers, whomever, whatever it is you believe in, 
That is so nice. It's just a wonderful way of showing gratitude for that food that has been provided to you. Okay. We already know that those in the Abrahamic faiths and other religions, they do that. You know, you show some thankfulness and gratitude for that food that you have in your hand. You can do that. You don't have to wait for one big ceremony or one big party or, you know, be in a ritualistic situation before you do that. You can do that each and every time you eat. You can just say, hey, come eat with me. Call upon them and say, come eat with me. And some, in some indigenous uh, religious practices, they would actually take, you know, if you have that plate of food, you would actually take maybe a morsel of it and throw it out and say, eat this with me or enjoy with me. And that again is a sign of respect. That in itself is also an offering to your spirit guides. So I know this has been a little bit long class, but I really wanted to get into great detail with this information because, oh, just getting into it and researching it and just speaking with a lot of people and practitioners about what they do and how they do, and then trying to synthesize that into this little class. I mean, that in itself is a challenge. This is such a huge area where, again, when you look at the plethora of indigenous spiritual and religious practices around the world in, in europe and africa and asia south america north america and australia wherever you have indigenous populations you will find offerings being made to spirit guides so it's not something strange it's not something weird it is something that is being done because it works so as usual we will end our class with our invocation we're thankful to our creator, our guardian spirit, our guardian angel. We're thankful to our ancestors, spirit guides, the messengers, the prophets, and all those in the unseen realms who help us unselfishly. They help us 24-7, 365, whenever we call. Let us be shown ways in which we can make tangible and intangible offerings that will please you all and encourage you to keep on helping us. Ashe.